Good morning, good afternoon, good and good evening to all of you on behalf of the German Academic Exchange Service. We are very happy that today's online seminar on best practices on the use of artificial intelligence in higher education received such a great interest from Asian and European participants. In November last year, we had our first online seminar on the ASM Expert Group of the ASM Expert Group Digitalization on the impact of artificial intelligence on learning and teaching in higher education, where the focus was more on a holistic dis discussion. There's also a recording available online and you will find the link in the chat. Today's discussions are aimed at the more practical perspective. The key idea is to bring together the teacher and the student's perspective to exchange views on the use of AI in today's teaching and learning and to improve the understanding of each other's actions and needs. Ideally, this can serve as a cross-regional platform for exchange and best practices and contribute to creating a mutually beneficial common ground for the use of AI in higher education institutions. The seminar will again be co-hosted by the German Academic Exchange Service and the ASM Education Secretariat. In the framework of the Asia Europe meeting, the German Academic Exchange Service is tasked with chairing the so-called ASM Expert Group on Digitalization. This working structure, which was set up in 2019, is composed of representatives from numerous ASM member states, as well as stakeholder organizations, covering academic and digitalization experts from universities and research institutes, governmental organizations, student bodies, and funding organizations. Amongst others, its tasks are to promote peer learning between its members and to strengthen collaboration and connectivity by identifying, sharing and promoting good practices of digitally enhanced education cooperation between Asia and Europe. And this is exactly the purpose of today's meeting. With this, I'll hand over to Vera Luque from the ASEM Education Secretariat. A warm welcome also from the ASM Education Secretariat, which is a rotating secretariat currently hosted by Italy in Rome and overseeing the education process of the Asia Europe meeting. Lots of activities connecting Asia and Europe in education are going on in the 51 member countries and promoting dialogue among the regions is one of the main aims of this intergovernmental cooperation platform. We are looking forward to today's discussions on one of the most debated topics of these years and thank the German Academic Exchange Service for organizing this and the speakers for giving us some further insights into learning and teaching from different perspectives. With this, I will leave you in the hands of Niels Tensi from the German Academic Exchange Service, who will continue to introduce you to this seminar. Thank you very much, Vera. Uh, now I'd like to invite everyone to a little warm-up exercise. For this, we've prepared a small poll with questions about how you are using and interacting with AI at your current place of study or work. Uh, ideally, you should now um, be seeing uh, a poll on your screen with a question whether you are using AI tools in your daily work or study environment. Please pick one of the answer options and then, uh, then let's see uh, what the others do. The question, op uh, the answer options are no, I'm not using it at all. Yes, I'm using it from time to time. And yes, I'm using it on a regular basis. And I'm happy to see that there's already quite a few responses coming in. Colorful picture. Yes, from time to time, about half the people present here in this webinar have answered that on a regular basis, also quite a few people. And uh, no, not at all, is the response by a relatively small group. Okay, let's wait some more seconds for answers to come in. Thank you very much. Then I Go on to the second question, which is, do you feel you have, uh, hang on, okay, yeah. Do you feel you have adequate guidance and support on the use of, uh, of artificial intelligence 
at your institution. That's awesome. Answers coming in. The options are, yes, there's plenty of guidance and support. Yes, there's some, but I would wish for more. There's a bit, but definitely not enough. No, there's almost none at all. Or the last option is, no, I don't need any guidance and support. You can just call me Superwoman or Superman when it comes to artificial intelligence. Okay, again, very colorful picture. Most people feel there's some but they would wish for more, or there's a bit, but definitely not enough. Okay, this looks very good. Thank you very much for these responses. This is in interesting and gives us a good start, I think, to the following discussion. And before we start with the presentation by our speakers, I have one uh, final technical information. During the seminar, we warmly invite you to share with us your questions and the questions and answers features. For this, please go to the menu at the bottom of the Zoom window and then click on the three dots that you find on the right side and choose Q&A. Now you should see a Q&A window uh, where you can submit your own questions and also you can upvote interesting questions that were raised by others by just clicking on the thumb. Those questions that are upvoted the most will be taken on by our moderator Ruben Janssens. And now to lose no further time, I'm directly handing over to Ruben. Ruben is an AI researcher at Ghent University in Belgium, um, currently pursuing a PhD and uh, developing AI for social robots in education. He has been supporting our Bologna Hub peer support project as an expert and used to be a member of the executive committee of the European Students Union, ESU. Ruben, thank you very much for being with us today. The floor is yours. Thank you so much, Nils, and a, a warm welcome for me as well. Good morning or evening or afternoon. Um, we will get uh, first into four presentations from our speakers here today. We have two students and two um, teachers, academics, uh, that will share their experience and insights into artificial intelligence in higher education with us today. Uh, we will start with the student perspectives, um, and we will hear one student from Asia and one from Europe. Uh, first, we will start with uh, Manan Singh from India. He's a third year undergraduate right now at the OP Jindal Global University, where he majors in history. Um, and he has founded Young Minds, which is a youth that initiative aimed at education and community empowerment. And he's really passionate passion by uh, public policy and social impact. Um, he's worked with Niti Ayok, the public policy think tank of the government of India, and the office of the member of parliament, Sujit Kumar. And at the Jindal Global University, he's holding leadership roles, including the being the general secretary of the History Society. So Manan, we're very happy to have we here, uh, you with us here today as well. Um, and then we have Ursula Lis from Poland. Um, she is studying electric and hybrid vehicles engineering at the Warsaw University of Technology. Uh, and she's been involved in the student mov movement since the beginning of her studies, uh, from the faculty level uh, to being the co-president of the Pan-European um, Enhance Alliance Student Forum. Uh, and now she's a member of the, um, she was a member of the executive committee of the Students' Parliament of the Republic of Poland. And now she's the membership coordinator of the European Students' Union. And there she works on AI and digitalization in the European Union and its influence on students' experience and higher education. So uh, thank you very much to both of you for being here with us. Um, both speakers have about 10 minutes for an initial presentation about their experience uh, with artificial intelligence in higher education. And we will start with uh, Manan. Manan, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Ruben. Uh, very warm greetings to everyone. And thank you, Ruben, for that very kind introduction from your end. So uh, let me begin by, I think, saying that my first introduction with AI was when I entered university in 2022. And I had looked at AI with a lot of skepticism when it first, and with, with a set of skepticism that I refrained from using any AI platforms on my laptop or mobile devices for a very long time. And it was only with the passage of time that I realized that AI is something that has come here to stay. And it has both its pros and cons. So when I talk about the pros and cons, certainly uh, just like any other machine, AI also helps human beings ease tasks. But while 
helping us it is also it becomes a problematic situation where the major discussion re revolving around ai is regarding the job markets right so ai though has both its pros and cons but what we need to realize is that we need to equip ourselves with the education of how to use ai effectively so that it helps us and it is a thing that is a tool which we use to enhance ourselves and to grow personally i would like to also share some examples from my university itself not only do we have courses now on ai which are very new but for the first time in india actually a master degree in artificial intelligence and data science has been started by the op general global university so this is a testament of the realization that education in ai is extremely important and when i sit here to talk about the asian perspective most asian countries are part of the global south most of these countries are developing or under developed countries not trying to make a weight assumption but considering their socio economic backgrounds they are not very technologically sound as well that is why education also becomes even more important and for someone like me who was coming from a well educated school from a background which was of a good school still had major skepticism regarding ai and was unsure about how to use it and how it will beneficial is something that needs to be catered to when not only at the university level but also before the university level because now technology is not only accessible at the time you reach university but also before that so it becomes very important to cater to education uh, to enable that i think on an asean level also when i talk about the ai teach for uh, asean is something which is a is a joint initiative of asean foundation and microsoft and which is very viable in order to teach ai skills to educators in the asean countries it caters to two goals which is improve teaching capabilities and enrich learning experience for students and such models and such modules are very important in order to empower people in the asean uh, region and in not only in asean but in the entire asian region to use ai effectively for their benefits similarly the ai center for educational technologies which has been opened uh, in collaboration with the ministry of education and national university of singapore is another example but let us also talk about why ai is important ai when it comes to asia in particular gets important according to me for three reasons one is the personalized learning it provides and i will uh, trace it back to amartya sen who is a famous economist from india and his approach what he calls as the capabilities approach where he mentions that providing capabilities is surely important but it is it also has to be personalized and customized according to the population the example he gives is that if you pass on uh, a cycle to each and every person you will also have to cater to someone who does not have legs so we'll have to give them a hand cycle right so in order to cater to the asian population i think ai becomes a very interesting tool because it helps you mo mold your academic journey according to your interests take an example of chat gpt which is i think the ai software which most people use you can prompt a question or ask something from chat gpt according to your own needs and it gives you a response as per the needs it is it is unlike maybe a google which has a generic set of responses ai customizes their re responses according to your needs and according to your setting moreover it also helps you analyze so ai as a machine as as the mechanism also reads through a lot of things which are in the background it really reads through the lines and tries to create an entire persona of the student in order 
for the teacher also to be able to customize their teaching for a better environment for the students. So I think personalized learning and providing the capabilities to students according to the settings is one very big uh, advantage of AI. Second, I think when we talk about again, Asia, and I will talk about from my home country's perspective, which is India, we as an area or as a continent are a continent of multilingualism. There are languages in India itself. There are uh, over 24 national language, uh, nationally recognized languages. And there are around thousands of languages that are spoken. Not only does AI ease communication, but also gives us access to a lot of literature, to a lot of information, which we would like to know, but could not do it before AI was present before us, before AI was there to help us because we were not able to read or we were not able to access those languages. Now the translation software that AI provides us is something that has really helped us enable to take knowledge, not only in the language we are proficient in, but in as many languages as we would like to. Thirdly, I would also like to talk about how AI makes things engaging. So as a tool, which is very creative in itself, I, I often uh, find AI to be very creative and surely more creative than I am. What it does is that it provides you a lot of fun ways to learn rather than catering just to the bookish kind of a knowledge or limiting yourself to maybe text and videos, AI games and it, it provides you with interactive and innovative ways of learning, which were not as present as they are today because of the advent of AI. Considering these three major broad benefits of AI, I would also like to highlight and reflect upon the idea that we need to use AI very mindfully and ethically because we if there is something that is provided to us, if there is something that is provided to us to help us, we, we have to use it to the level where we're not misusing it and not just misusing it, also not becoming dependent on it. So another threat which comes with AI is the dependence of AI. And I think that is something uh, we as students need to be very careful of. And I think I would be, uh, no, I would not be wrong in saying that a lot of us now have started to use AI for our examinations. There was a very recent case in India where a student actually reached the high court and filed a complaint saying, filed a petition saying that you cannot disregard my assignment for the use of AI. So uh, if, if you use AI to that level, I think then also it becomes a little problematic because because then you are not using your own minds and uh, AI becomes your mind. And then that becomes problematic because your perspective and your views are not out there. They are just the views of the technology, something that has been coded by some other human being that are out there in public and you are not building your own capability, but AI is your capability. So uh, in, in that sense, I think keeping the pros and cons of AI in mind, we need to build a, a very suitable balance where AI becomes an asset to us and does not become uh, a liability which becomes problematic for us in the future where when we are trying to maybe go somewhere for jobs or trying to do something on our own, we feel that we are not capable enough because we would need support of an AI or another software. So I would like to just conclude by saying that as good as an AI is, it also has its flaws, but it is here to stay. And as students, though it is helping us a lot, it is being a great tool, great asset for each one of us. Let us use it as an asset uh, and not become dependent on it. Thank you. Thank you very much, madam. Um, thank you for highlighting 
uh, those interesting aspects that you mentioned, such as uh, personalized learning and the need for education about uh, AI, uh, the use for multilingualism, that's really interesting as well. Um, but also, of course, yeah, the, the, the dangers of um, unethical use or becoming dependent on it. So thank you very much for this presentation and for keeping within time as well. Uh, and then we go to Ursula from, for a European student's perspective. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, is my presentation visible? Yes, perfect. Okay, great. Uh, uh, hi, my name is Ursula Lies. I'm from European Students' Union. And I would like to present to you today with the perspective of students and how, what is their outlook on AI in education, as well as some examples of what students in European Union and not only there are using every day already to uh, encourage their own learning and to further improve uh, the learning processes. Um, so, okay. What do students need from AI in education? Those answers are gathered from not only surveys, but also simply talking with representatives of students from all over Europe and not only. And those are the most common themes that came up during those talks. Uh, the first one is personally realized learning paths uh, where AI can help tailor learning experience of students to their individual needs and adapting the pace and uh, content based on their each on each student's uh, strengths with weaknesses and interests. And um, this allows students to learn on their own pace and speed and follow paths that they uh, want in their own unique learning style. Um, the next one would be adaptive assessments and feedback. Uh, students need and want timely and constructive feedback to improve their uh, understanding and performance. Um, and AI-powered assessment can adjust in real time, providing uh, hints and personalized guidance to students throughout their own time uh, during learning, uh, not only in school, but also at home using their own time to improve their own skills. Uh, the next one would be the enhanced accessibility. So what is often mentioned by students is that we need inclusivity and accessibility. Uh, AI can help. It's not the only uh, solution to whatever problems we have, but it can help break down the barriers for students with disabilities by providing assistance uh, such as uh, text-to-speech and real-life translations, which not only help students with disabilities, but also uh, students that maybe do not have certain languages uh, like capabilities. So if their English is not perfect, but they want to listen to a lecture made in English by some foreign professor, uh, those AI tools can help them access that knowledge and further um, get more involved in their study processes. Um, the next one would be lifelong learning support, uh, which uh, impacts students and not only. Uh, we all, uh, our goal is to create uh, educational processes which allow everyone to uh, learn throughout their lives and to stay relevant in their field of study. Uh, whether they finished the study a year ago or 10 years ago, it is important to keep up the skills and AI can help with that process as well. Having said all of that, now we can move on to the examples of AI apps and tools used by students more, most often and how those tools connect to the needs of students mentioned before. Uh, so the first one, obviously, it is ChatGPT, which is the most famous one and used by uh, probably 90% of students worldwide, not only uh, in Europe. Uh, obviously, uh, as you can see on the side, I'm one of the students that use AI and ChatGPT quite intensely. And so the most common goals with using ChatGPT and uh, programs similar to this, because obviously it's not the only one uh, program that is there, 
that's uh, using it to analyze data given in the study. If we do not understand how some processes work, we can input a specific prompt into ChatGPT to help us understand more on the subject or explain further to us what was mentioned in some texts, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it can help uh, assist, maybe like it's, let's put it this way, with writing uh, some documents for school. Not only, uh, I wouldn't say exam papers, uh, maybe let's not use AI for that, but it can help even write an official letter to a rector or a document, which some students are not the best in, but it is it does influence uh, the later decision making processes. If a letter is poorly written, it will be ignored. But if it's well written, maybe the student will get additional funding, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it can help summarize a text, which is very often used by students with a very long old text from textbooks. If they want to find out a specific information, they can use it to help them uh, with time management. The next one is Grammarly. Uh, this is also connected to the language barrier. Uh, it is a program that you can put input a document written in English, currently only English, and it corrects your mistakes. But not only that, you can set goals about how the text should sound. So for instance, if you want it to sound academic or business or general, what language should you use to write it? So you choose the domain, the intent, the target audience and formality that you want to use, whether it is a post on Facebook encouraging your students, uh, peers to join you for, I don't know, uh, an event at your university. You can use that to encourage them. You set up those goals, you input a simple text, uh, like the one you can see on the left side, and then you have review suggestions. So it underlines all the possible mistakes or uh, maybe finds a better wording of something so you could uh, sound more uh, firm or engaged, which further uh, not only corrects your mistakes, but it also uh, explains why it is a possible mistake. So as we can see, there is a rewrite for clarity. So it explains what we can write uh, instead of that. So it's not only just does something for you, but you have an uh, input and outlook on what was made wrong so you can improve yourself. So your language skills improve with every single use of such uh, Tool. As you can see, there is a rewrite sen sentences or change the wording, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and it shows you the correctness of the text, clarity, engagement, delivery, everything that we would like to have a constant feedback on when we're learning another language. <clears throat> Sorry, and at the end you have a performance score. Uh, that shows you the number of characters, the readability of text, which further can improve your language skills. Uh, next one is my absolute favorite right now. I use it a lot for my work and my studies. Um, my peers do the same. It's Notebook LM, and it's the most uh, complicated, maybe not complicated, it's quite simple to use, but it's uh, it can be used for various reasons. And it looks like this. Uh, for the need of this presentation, I chose to use uh, the digital education action plan as a core document that I would want to use to present it to you. So I input the uh, document into the notebook LM and then, uh, sorry for the Polish version, but uh, unfortunately that's my settings on my computer. So I input the, the AP Act uh, into the program and then the program analyzed it. And from there, it created like suggestions for me regarding this uh, document and also more. So for instance, it simplifies the information given in the document. So it created an AI generated podcast about the DAP that explains in more layman's terms 
what it is about in a way that sounds realistic. So it allows students, and not only students, general population, to use it to learn not only reading the text, but if it's more complicated uh, document, you can just put it in the, the program. It can create a podcast that you can listen to during, I don't know, cleaning, uh, cooking, whatever you need to do, but you at the same time can keep up and keep learning in a suitable for you way. And I just want to present to you how natural, scarily natural it sounds uh when i put in the pop podcast and what it created hey everyone and welcome back for another deep dive today we're going to be exploring the future of learning specifically in the eu sounds interesting yeah and we've got this fascinating eu commission document to guide us uh it's called the 2020 action plan for digital education okay it covers a pretty long period actually from 2021 to 2027 wow and it really lays out a roadmap for how I'm going to stop here because the podcast is quite long. It's 30 minutes because the document is quite long. But as you can could hear, it sounds really natural. The inflictions in your voice, it doesn't sound like something AI generated. So our brain doesn't like block it. It's it's natural way of learning. But besides only the podcast, which is an amazing feature in itself, uh, we can have uh, the option to summarize the document. So the first block is DAP summary. Next one is I could choose to create a timeline mentioned in the document when everything related to the document was uh, done. Uh, frequently asked questions that can appear uh, about the document with answers given. So it's not only useful for students, but also for professors, for every professional out there. And uh, my last, uh, the last one I want to mention about it, it's questions for a quiz. I put in the prompt to create a quiz for students regarding the DAP Act, and it created questions with uh, key answers, including keywords that the professor should look for in the answer, that it should be uh, uh, graded as a full answer. So back again, it's not only useful for students, but we should look into those kinds of programs uh, to include into the learning experience uh, from both the students and the staff side. And the last ones is our basic mentions of math, math AI apps and more, which is, uh, we often mention that the uh, industry boom of AI became like, came in 2022, mostly. But I remember at the beginning of my studies, we used a lot of math AI apps during the COVID pandemic when we didn't have access to professors 24 seven, like at the faculty, when we could come up to them and ask them for a solution, we use those apps where we can take a photo of a math problem and it spews out the answer, but not only uh, a solution to it as in a calculator with just the answer, but by step and by, but a step-by-step -step explanation, uh, including what to use, so uh, where you can click on it and then have an explanation of what a limit is, what is the word evaluate, et cetera, et cetera. So it not only shows the student the, uh, the answer, but also explains on the way, how did we come to the answer? And the last one, uh, to not bore you with more examples, as there are many, many more AI programs out there, it's Tutor AI and similar programs like this, where you can input the topic that you're interested in or a question that you're interested in. And the Tutor AI will summarize something for you, explain for you, create a more educational path, how to get from the point you're looking at from being interested in programming to actually know something more about programming. So yeah, that would be all. Thank you all for listening. Um, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Usana. I uh, already saw in the in the Q and A that people found this very interesting. So thank you for uh, both the general outline and and the very concrete tools uh, that you and, and other students are using. And I sure like wish that I had no book when back when I was in the European Students Union because those EU documents are quite um, 
quite a hassle to read. Um, all right, so thank you very much, Ursula and Manan, for the student perspective. And now we're uh, going straight to the teacher perspective. So for that, we also have two um, speakers here today that we're very happy to have join us. Um, first, from an Asian perspective, we have uh, Jonathan JSK. Um, and he is currently a UNESCO program manager for digital learning at the Asia Pacific University. Um, he has extensive teaching experience across various levels from a foundation to master's degrees in disciplines such as marketing, e-commerce, brand management and innovation. And then he's been very actively involved in AI workshops for lecturers and students. He's uh, trained close to 5,000 participants in at least 15 countries. Um, so he's absolutely the, the right person to help uh, us today understand how teachers are using AI in education. He's been the chair for the AI Summit of ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, uh, and he's currently also pursuing a PhD in computing with a focus on educational technology. And after Jonathan, we will hear from um, Carlos Delgado Clos. He is a full professor of telematics engineering um, at the Universidad de Carlos uh, III of Madrid, um, and he's also a rector's delegate there for digital micro credentials uh, at that same university. Um, he's the director of the GASD research group um, and also director of the UNESCO chair on scalable digital education for all. His main research uh, interests um, are involved with educational technology, and he also coordinated several MOOCs. Um, currently, he is presenting, um, he's promoting the adoption of digital micro credentials in Spain through the CERTI Digital Project. And at the moment, he's producing a MOOC about education, AI in education. Um, and when I talk about MOOCs, I, of course, may, uh, talk about massive open online courses. So uh, very happy to have the both of you here today. And we will start off with Jonathan for the Asian perspective on AI uh, in higher education by teachers. Thank you, Ruben. And a good day, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to you, wherever you are, and welcome. Uh, I want to start off by giving a big congratulations to Ursula and Manan uh, for giving us, the teachers, a deeper insight into how our students are using AI. Yeah, and also, Manan was talking a lot about some of the challenges and dangers. Well, from a teacher's perspective, we feel that AI has been a excellent teaching assistant, an excellent research assistant, an excellent assistant in so many ways. But to some extent, I agree with what Ursula and Manan especially said that uh, there's so many tools out there that teachers sometimes get confounded. They're not sure which tool to use. And, and even when they do figure out, okay, this is the tool, then how to use it, even, even the basic tool, the large language model, chat GPT, um, teachers sometimes find that they don't know how to use it, or they're using it and, and they're not sure if they are um, using it correctly, using it in a suitable, optimal way possible. So as, as Ruben mentioned, uh, my team has been involved in a lot of training and, and some of the things that we realized early on that there is a very strong lack of training even. And, and today I want to share with you a little bit about a training program put together by teachers, for teachers to empower teachers to use AI at, at the APU under the uh, UNESCO Chair Initiative. We call this AID, which stands for Artificial Intelligence, Innovative Design in Education. We're using AI to give teachers a helping hand to be innovative in the education. And um, it's a, it's, it, there are many projects under aid dealing with uh, generative AI, but mainly the framework refers to creating guidelines for use. Because the first step in using is, is to have a set of guidelines that people know, okay, this is something I can do. This is something I should not do with AI. Yeah. So uh, proper guidelines, we're, we're stopping short from calling it a policy because when we wrote up these guidelines, it was early last year and AI was still very much in its infancy and we were not sure how it would evolve. So coming up with something like a policy uh, was a bit strong. So we're calling it guidelines. 
Uh, we also do a lot of advocacy on the use of AI. For example, when we wanted to reach out to, to a university in Africa, the vice chancellor actually said, you know, before you train people, can you explain to people, explain to my teachers, what is it? Because at that point, a lot of people's perception was that the use of AI equated to cheating, finding shortcuts. So we needed to break or, or break through that mindset that it's not cheating, it's an assistant that will help you. Um, and of course, the upskilling and support. But the biggest impact of the aid program actually comes from its training modules, a very comprehensive package of modules that is designed for every day use for teachers in every level of teaching. We have on the ground trained teachers from the kindergarten, preschool level, right up to university professors on the use of AI. Yeah, we, I'll show you the modules in a little bit. Uh, these modules have been put together by teachers, expert teachers, teachers with over 40 years each and collectively maybe over 100 years of teaching experience. People who are skilled in instructional design, people who are skilled in the use of generative AI. These are the people that came together and put these modules together. And, and these modules are the ones that we use for training. Now, apart from that, AID also is very interested in research. We want to know what's happening. We want to contribute as well to what's happening. So some of the things I think Ruben mentioned earlier that I chaired a committee that organized the ASEAN Stakeholder Summit early this year, where we conducted a survey among 11 ASEAN countries, uh, with teachers, students, school administrators, education ministry people, education technology people, etc., to find out how AI is being used by them on the ground, not theoretical level, at real world level on the ground. And we collected this data, we analyzed it, we put it out into teams, and then we invited representatives from the 11 countries, and also AI and education experts from around the world to come together and look at these challenges and opportunities and, and chart uh, ways forward for the use of AI in the ASEAN region. So aid is a very comprehensive, this is the framework that we developed where we believe that upskilling has to happen only after guidelines and advocacy is done. And very importantly, after you upskill someone because the technology is so relatively new, people still need support. And for each of the programs or the modules that we develop, there are online resources and there are AI powered chatbots that can answer questions 24 seven, right? So if, if we train somebody to do something using AI and they're trying it out later on their own and they're stuck, they can always refer back to the chatbots. So let me just introduce you very quickly to the AI modules. They, are, they all start with AI. And uh, the one that is focused for higher education teachers is the one at uh, 10 o'clock, AI LD, AI Powered Learning Design. Now in this, we have trained teachers, or higher education teachers, and we teach them how to use AI to create the most basic things that a teacher or a lecturer needs. Lesson plans, content, videos, images, assessment, and, and I think both Manan and Ursula mentioned in, in their presentation that one of the benefits they find from AI is the personalized feedback. And when we as teachers use AI to create assessments, we can use, we can create different sets of assignments for the different sets of teachers in our class. Teachers in this session would probably be familiar with universal design for learning where we want to try and meet every person in the classroom. So AI helps us to speed up the process of creating content for a variety of learners, creating assessments for a variety of learners. And AI LD, the module, takes teachers, guides them hands-on. And, and most of these modules are run on a full day basis, where it's not just a trainer sharing information, it is actually hands-on for the teachers to use it. So I show the teacher something, then I say, okay, now you do. 
and then you share it with me. And each of this module has an output. So we are running an AI LD program module for teachers. At the end of that workshop day, the teacher will take away a fully complete lesson plan, which they can use in their teaching the very next day. A lesson plan that is customized to their class, customized to the different needs of students in their class, etc. The AIRE, academic research and academic writing, the outputs are very clear at the beginning. The moment you start the workshop, you know that at the end of the day, for example, if you're doing AI powered academic research, by the end of the day, you will have an outline at least of a proposal, a research proposal, an introduction, literature review, and your methodology. That will be our output. So, this is something that the participants uh, take away with them at the end of the session. Uh, AI AW, AI Teach, and AI Learn, these are all academic programs. AI HP and AI Gold are very are more tailored towards healthcare. And AI Leap is for administration. Um, a lot of teachers also do a lot of administrative work. Hence, uh, an AI module that teaches the teacher how to use AI to simplify or even automate routine tasks becomes very helpful for the teacher. Yep. Moving on very quickly. Um, just want to emphasize that uh, these, whatever I'm sharing with you, these are facts that are, that are based on a year and a half of constant training, uh, trained more than 5,000 participants, teachers from all levels, students from high school, students from university, um, across 15 countries. We've engaged with students in brown bag sessions and advocacy sessions. Um, our team has written three books on AI in education, um, 15 articles and book chapters. And very importantly, all these modules that we train are available for teachers online. They can be accessed. Of course, being a hands-on workshop, the impact is better when it's face-to-face, -face, but in events where it's not possible, um, or in events where after the face-to-face, -face, people need some learning on their own, they can always access the online uh, versions of the modules as well. And I want to share a few of the pictures of trainings conducted across the world. The ones that you see on the top left is Sri Lanka. And then on, on the top right is East Malaysia. Um, on the bottom, you can see uh, some trainings that took place in Africa, in Tanzania and Ethiopia. And, and these are people, these are teachers, all of them are teachers um, who have come for these sessions because teachers want to improve themselves. I think as Ursula so clearly demonstrated, there are so many tools that a student is using. And, it's, and sometimes it's difficult for a teacher to keep ahead of this, one step ahead. Teachers are playing catch up at this point of time. So, so teachers want to be trained, teachers need to be trained, and, and we feel that from a teacher's perspective, the only way for you to properly support and empower your students with AI is if you are well trained with AI yourself. So thank you. The team that's behind aid is what I'm showing on the screen. It's a team made up of people from Asia Pacific University and also international, etc. Yeah. Once again, thank you very much for your time. All right, thank you so much, Jonathan, for this uh, really interesting overview of uh, how you're supporting teachers and how teachers can use AI uh, through the AID program. Um, so thank you, Jonathan. And then last but not least, we go to Professor Carlos delgado Gloss um, for a European perspective uh, on how teachers are using AI here in higher education. So Carlos, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with these esteemed colleagues in presentations. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. It's now 10 to 10 here in Central Europe. I will go relatively fast because I have many things to tell you. So uh, the teacher perspective. Uh, I, I would like to um, quote here Mustafa Suleiman, who was the CEO of DeepMind that was later on acquired by Google. He said in this book, The Coming Wave, everything is about to change. 
And by everything, we mean everything, all the different sectors of different industries, and in particular also education. And there in, in education also in many different respects. This is the outline of my talk. I will talk about most of the time about how AI can be used for the different processes that take place when teaching. I'll mention briefly uh, other related uh, aspects, not, not in teaching, but for professors, for university professors or for teachers in general. And also a word of caution because not everything is so nice and, 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 and bright. So AI for teaching. <clears throat> Let's uh, divide the role of the teacher into first understanding the topics to teach before teaching. If I have to deep dive into the, the topic to be taught, then as a professor, I have to prepare the education material, slides, images, documents, etc. And then I have to go to class to teach it. So in each of these three different uh, aspects, we can use AI. And let's go through them briefly. Understanding the topics to teach. I have divided this also into three parts. The research for the course preparation, transforming documents, etc., and to find or define a syllabus for, for my class. No? Nowadays, the literature, the knowledge grows exponentially, so that it's impossible to read everything about a particular topic to be taught. So one needs help to navigate through the relevant documents. And there, AI can help us either with generic AI tools like ChatGPT, uh, Copilot, Gemini, Claude Bianthropic, etc., or Baidu in China, for instance. But now there are also many specific research assistants but, uh, <clears throat> that help you in understand topics, summarize it, what is the state of the art, etc. There we can use, for instance, I like to mention consensus and, and research drive, etc., as useful tools that can be used in really to understand a particular field. Then we need also maybe to understand, to summarize, to, to be able to rephrase, to, to, to make sense out of these documents. And there also AI is, is brilliant in summarizing, rephrasing, explaining concepts, elaborating text, changing the style, identifying examples and counterexamples, etc. And we did the same. It, it, now there are so many video uh, content that is useful, that is interesting, but we have no time to go through the videos, even if we go at twice the speed. Therefore, there are applications like Merlin or Rio that makes us a summary, a, an outline of a particular video uh, with the times, and, and, and then I can go maybe to those parts that are most relevant to me rather than listening to the whole video. If I need to define a, a course syllabus, well, I can just ask it. I have asked it now to, to, to Gemini, who gives me three proposals, no? a course description, objective requirements, division by classes, uh, additional resource, etc. So this is a, maybe not the definitive. Maybe it's just an inspiration for me, but it can help me to define if I'm defining a new um, course. Preparing education materials, second topic. There's lots of things. I, as a professor, I need to prepare documents, uh, mind maps, slides, images, videos, other complex objects, assessments for evaluation. In all these different kinds of material, I can uh, seek help. Documents we have mentioned as well for translating, for correcting. We have seen Grammarly before to change formats, etc. Documents can be, in particular, structured documents. This means with some in, inherent structure, with tags or, or with markup, etc., like HTML. No, so AI knows all the H, uh, web pages, all the HTML. So I can ask directly, uh, write a, a web page for whatever topic, or LaTeX, which is the format for professional uh, academic uh, papers. Uh, it's also a structured document, and there are many modules. For instance, I've used it here by asking, sorry about this, it's in Italian, it comes from a book in Italian. Uh, uh, I asked it to 
design an electric circuit with some particular elements there uh, in latex. There's a module in latex, so it not, AI does not only know latex, but also the modules there and designs this circuit for me. Mind maps. Mind maps or conceptual maps, and in particular also structured documents. So we can go through LaTeX, HTML, markup, or some particular mind map languages, XML languages like OPML, to design things that look graphically but have a structure, a, a textual representation as a structured document. I can ask it also. I've used here, I don't know what I will chat GPT and um, I don't know what, what other uh, AI tool. So even if it's not purely text, I can use AI. Slides. There are many applications there that help you make slides. And also applications we use, like Google Slides or Microsoft PowerPoint, are increasingly including AI features into it. Images. I think it's not uh, necessary to highlight the extraordinary power of generating images. Also, I've not mentioned here uh, some other form where the, where the text uh, <coughs> is uh, very clear. I can use it to increase the resolution of uh, images. I can use it to extend images in the same style. So this is really uh, mind blowing. Videos. I can generate synthetic videos. Synthesia is one of the first applications there. Hedgen is also a very good one, but there are many others like DAD, Colossian Video, that can be used to create videos. Let me show you just one video I've used, I've, I made a, a MOOC, a massive open and chorus for Italian professors, but they don't speak Italian. So you, let's use AI to pretend or <laughs> to have the effect of uh, uh, speaking perfectly Italian. I grandi modelli di linguaggio, gli LLM, sono innanzitutto dei maestri del linguaggio, gestiscono il linguaggio in modo incredibile. What has happened here? So it's a, uh, um, what my voice was cloned. The, I, I spoke, the video was recorded in Spanish. So the Spanish, uh, there was speech to text, and then this, this Spanish text was translated to Italian. Then my voice was cloned, and then there was also uh, lip sync. So the lips were speaking, uh, were moving according to the Italian. Complex objects. I can generate programming. And this is increasingly uh, being used also in professional environments to not to program yourself, but to get the code um, designed by AI. For instance, with ChatGPT Canvas, you can translate, um, generate the code, add documents, fix bugs, go to another language, review code, et cetera. Or code art artifacts that allow you to Generate, I generated here uh, an image, an interactive image for the uh, mortgage rate, uh, where I can change the, the, the amount uh, which was um, um, asked for, the, the monthly uh, the number of months, etc. So they can, I it generated a code that I didn't, I don't need to see, but they can just interact and use it for educational purposes. So, and also for assessments and rubrics, I can uh, use either general purpose AI tools or particular other tools that are coming up like Prepare Equilions that allow us as teachers to generate um, assessment. Okay, so this is for preparing education material. I will go a bit fast. The fa last part would be teaching the class where I can also uh, ask for help, give me teaching methods, how can I explain this concept, what is the best way, give me three teaching methods for teach whatever, or generate a script for one particular class that in order to teach whatever in a collaborative way and, and, and propose some activities for the students, or I can also uh, give feedback to learners. Uh, for instance, if a learner submits a, a work, a program, an essay, and I want to make sure that it was their own writing, that their own uh, authored by them. I can ask the AI to prepare questions for me on the basis of this work in order to really see 
whether the students were the authors. So you see that too many things really to be mentioned in this uh, few minutes, but just to uh, finalize, let me just briefly mention this, not just for teaching, also for what to teach. We as teachers have to rethink what we teach to the students because in the, in the world the students will live and will work in will be completely changed. So I need to not only change the way I teach, but also the content of what I teach. Secondly, not just teaching, also research for research purposes, for data analysis, for defining new algorithms, for discovering new drugs, AI is also having a great impact. And finally, not on, only for teachers, also for learners, uh, for students, AI can be used, we have seen some examples there, but in the different uh, parts of the, uh, of the process, for attending lectures, to get the input from a professor and be able to record uh, his or her uh, lecture and then ask questions about it, get examples, get simplified, etc. like an application like StudyFetch. For independent study, we have looked, uh, seen before Notebook LM, and even for collaborative study, where in forums, student forums where students are participating, there can be an additional participant, which is an AI, which makes errors sometimes, but so do students, and but all together, between the, all the students and the AI, they, I'm sure, can reach the correct um, uh, answer. So let me just finalize by saying that, that on, not everything is so bright, not everything is wonderful, no, there's a problem, and we have to default also of dependence, also of country depend a sovereignty, of privacy, issues with regulation, with intellectual property, what were the images uh, this uh, tool was um, um, trained with, hallucination, the quality of result, biases, which is being correctly, uh, partially, uh, with time, and the impact on our lives. And with this, I finish my 10, 12 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you so, so much, Carlos. Uh, this was really interesting. You covered a lot of ground in 10 minutes, um, but I think this gave a really great overview of how we can use uh, AI for teaching, but also lots of different AI tools. So that was really nice. Um, and I'll also remind everyone that this session is being recorded and you can watch the recording afterwards. Um, so you can you can get back into all these details that were mentioned in a bit more um, on your own pace. So now uh, I'd like to ask all the, the uh, speakers back so we can have a, a, a little panel discussion here um, about different aspects of using AI in teaching and learning. And I'll also remind everyone uh, that you can ask questions to the panelists, to the speakers using the Q&A function. So first we will start with uh, some questions that we have prepared that we are really interested in. Uh, but as some people have already done, you can ask your questions and you can also upvote those um, that other people have asked and that will tell us uh, which questions that are most interested, uh, interesting for everyone. So um, in this panel discussion, I'd like to talk about three main aspects. So first of all, uh, let's go into a bit more detail on how AI is being used in, in Asia and Europe in teaching and learning. Um, second, I want to look at how we can um, how we have to handle AI and what we have to um, what we have to do to make us better at using AI. Uh, and finally, um, let's look a bit more into the future uh, how we have to change our system um, of of education. So let's start first a bit more about how we are actually using AI. So we heard a few uh, concrete ways in which both students and teachers are using artificial uh, intelligence. But I'd like to ask uh, Manan as well. Um, maybe you can give some more concrete um, insights in how students, um, mostly in, in Asia or, or um, around you in India, are using artificial intelligence right now. Like, what are some really concrete use cases that people um, are using certain tools for? Sure. I think one major thing which people are using AI for is surely to find answers to a lot of so so not only for assignment basis for but for academic purposes i would say in a broader sense it would be for academic purposes in a sense where from school you had to you want to some like, like ursula uh, discussed in order to summarize something to better analyze something in order to be able to conceptualize something uh, which you might find complicated in the original text 
but you want to simplify the meaning of uh, a particular maybe an article or a book a summary of an article so i think broadly for that uh, secondly it is also being often used for designing so for creative purposes like designing posters for designing you know, a lot of other creatives thirdly i think also it would include a lot of research a part of academics but broadly research when it comes to creating your own library uh, getting your what the work you have written and uh, check grammarly as was mentioned to check grammar etc so i think uh, when it comes to the use case and from the higher education standpoint when i say uh, i would agree with uh, the the softwares which ursula had shown in her presentation and i think for asia also it will be very similar because higher education and at least the top tier higher education institutes the students are using very similar kind of ai software okay really interesting so also to help you understand materials to help you design things and get feedback on, on things like your writing and all of that using kind of the same tools um also maybe you can give us some insight then in how you think that this uh, patterns of usage uh, differ between Europe and Asia. So we heard a bit about concrete tools and approaches um, all all around from both you and Manan. Um, but how do you see that differs? I would actually say it's quite similar. So uh, students throughout the whole process, uh, I know the universities can tend to differ between themselves, but uh, the student life is quite similar wherever you go. Uh, the learning patterns, the the courses that the students take, the need of something and the, the need to prepare for uh, the life after studies. It's quite similar. So I wouldn't say it differs really. I would just say that it's very similar and that, uh, yeah, I, I don't think it differs at all. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Emanan, you, you seem to agree with this as well. Yeah. Definitely, I think I totally agree. At least, again, as I mentioned, the top tier institutions, at least uh, the student life, the academic curriculum patterns, the vision of the institutions are similar. So the approach students are using AI with is also very similar when it comes to both Asia and Europe. Okay, interesting. Thank you. Um, going back to the to the teacher side, um, Jonathan, can you also give us some some um extra perhaps concrete insights in, in what you see that teachers are actually uh, using um, in terms of AI for their teaching. You're still muted, so we can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, yeah. so, um, for teachers, I think the use of AI helps them to be more innovative and creative. One, one example I can think of the top of my head is video is a very powerful teaching tool. And, and before the advent of AI video making tools, um, teachers who wished to make videos for their classroom, who wished to use videos in their classroom, had to depend on YouTube. And in YouTube, you find videos that you need to worry about the copyright issues of using them. And the biggest challenge is, even bigger than copyright, the bigger challenge is, how do you find a video that is really contextual to your class? You find a video that's 10 minutes long, but you only need two minutes of the content. And then, then you, you start editing and script. With, with, with AI, um, you can actually create a video that is specific to your topic, to your class, and you can create that in less than 30 minutes. And the better you get, I think 15 minutes, you're done. So you can actually create this contextual videos and images, etc. cetera. Um, other examples are like, if I want to write case studies, again, I don't have to depend on external. I can actually prompt AI to create contextual customized case studies for my class based on my students' uh, needs. If I move into the area of, uh, say, assessment, I can use, uh, teachers can use AI to help. Um, you know, when you, when you provide feedback to students, sometimes if you're grading 100 scripts, by the time you reach script number 50, the human mind gets tired. But if you have an AI supporting you with the uh, feedback, uh, AI does not get tired. I think a lot of universities now are also looking at helping teachers with creating assessments using AI. 
as a first round of grading before the teacher steps in. So these are just some of the examples that are top of my head of how we can actually concretely use them in teaching. Okay, cool. Really interesting. So yeah, creating these really personalized uh, learning materials, even videos for uh, individual courses. And that's really, that, that sounds really powerful. It kind of goes against the trend as well of actually like sharing very much learning material all around the world, because now everyone can really make the ones that uh, they see as the most fit for their course. Right. Okay. Um, uh, Carlos, the same, same question again to you. Like, do you see any differences in how it's being used in, in Europe and, and Asia? Um, well, I cannot give a good answer. I just guess, no? I, I think a, 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 a important difference is in Europe, we have GDPR, the GDPR, the general that data protection regulation, which is good to have, which is something positive. But it's a hindrance to the advance of things. So there are some tools which could not, cannot be used here in Europe no? uh, because of this, of GDPR issues, no? And maybe it can be used elsewhere. No? Uh, I'm not saying that GDPR should be removed. On the opposite, it's it's a good thing to have, but it's there, no, and and it has an effect on the availability of of tools, no, and 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 how we can use them, no. And so this might be, I think, a big difference. That was the biggest difference because otherwise people will try to use what is available, what is useful, what is makes uh, life more efficient in any way. Okay, yeah, that, that's a really interesting uh, and important difference. Um, do, you, do you see any differences within teachers, like within the broader group of teachers um, across Europe, close to you, um, in how they use AI? I would say that since this is a very new development and a very fast development, uh, the knowledge of what is available varies very much. You know? There are people maybe who know uh, uh, up to date to the latest state of the art of tools and others maybe which are not so much in, well informed no i think this is the may, can be a big difference on the personal way of the institutional way of how universities are promoting different tools what support they are giving to teachers what what uh, professional development courses they have for teachers so there might be differences there because everything is moving so fast every day we are uh, astonished of what uh, new tool appears, uh, but yeah, but not everybody is aware of these tools. No, this this might be the the biggest difference. Yeah, both the awareness and and the level of feeling comfortable and knowing what you can do with that obviously it differs a lot. And we also see that in research, it just goes way too fast uh, to keep up with. But that brings me straight to my second um, my second question: How? Um, how do we, how can we, and should we strengthen the capacity of those students and teachers to uh, use AI? Like what kind of uh, training or informing measures are needed? And uh, I'll first go back to the student side. Um, Ursula, maybe you can give us some insights in what kind of capacity building measures are, are needed right now. I think the first thing we should tackle is the lack of uh, information regarding how to use AI on humanitarian studies so i obviously use a lot of ai and i know a lot of ai because of the stem part of my studies uh, but i would argue that uh the students uh that study for instance linguistics will use ai even more than i do because i will program it but i won't use it as much to writing etc so i think there is this lack of um uh, interdisciplinarity collaborations regarding AI in institutions, and also the gap of teachers and students uh, regarding the usage of AI and uh, how we can influence it. So I think those are the gaps that we should close before thinking even further how to use AI. We should teach people how to use it before we start using it properly. Because right now we're starting from the behind, and I think there might be a slight clash in the future of what we're trying to implement and what is uh, realistic right now. Yeah, so looking at different disciplines and also making sure that um, people first are really well trained in using them before we roll out further. But you also mentioned the gap between students and teachers. Can you elaborate a bit more on that? Uh, yeah, but I... I uh, 
I mean, there is also a gap between students and students and teachers and teachers. You know, everybody is different. Obviously, I don't want to generalize the whole group of people, but uh, there seems to be a tendency of teachers to be more negatively, uh, having more negative outlook on AI than students. And I'm not saying that the students having, having this hurrah moment with AI is good because we should have this uh, awareness that AI is not uh, this perfect creation that will solve all our issues and is uh, always truthful when whatever we, we are thinking about it. But there is those two very different approaches which create this kind of tension when it comes to creating even simple guidelines in universities. So I think that that gap and also capabilities of using AI. Uh, so those two things regarding the gap between students and the teachers, that would be it. Yeah. yeah, so the general attitude towards uh, using AI is, is, is mostly very different. Um, right, Manan, same question to you. Uh, what kind of capacity building measures do you think are needed? What do students really need to be able to better use AI? I think the first two capacity building measures that are required are awareness and advocacy. And I say that for two reasons. One, I think is very similar to what Ursula mentioned in the skepticism, at least when it comes to the student teacher relationship. But when I, again, bring in the Asian perspective, what also we need to realize is the diversity of the population in Asia, as well as uh, the socioeconomic uh, demographics of this area. So accessibility of AI at different, I, I would, but due to the lack of a better word right now, I would say classes, but uh, at different classes in society in Asia, and so 78% of India's population is right now literate as per the last census. And a lot of Asian countries are not at, have a very high literacy rate. So when we talk about education and higher education and AI use with amongst the uh, students, it also needs to be catered according to their socio-economic demographics and their understanding of not just AI, but even technology. How much are they even equipped with handling basics of technology? Because even smartphones may be a new thing for many of them, and they might be immediately encountering something uh, which is literally doing everything and doing more than what you even knew before. So that that is why I say that in order to not only bridge the gap between the teacher student relationship, but also, uh, as Jonathan mentioned, uh, even in the catch up of what all the entire population of these countries to be able to understand AI at least at the basic level. Awareness and advocacy are two things that will need to be the first step so that the people know the why of the AI, the what of the AI, and the how of the AI, that why is it required. How do you navigate your way around it? And also then what do you do with it? So I think that has to be the first step when we talk about capacity building. All right, yeah, making sure that everyone is aware, but also a, a general uh, need for technology um, awareness and, and being able to use technology. Um, that's really interesting, thank you. Um, Carlos, I'll, I'll go to you and, and ask uh, what you think are the, the capacity building measures needed for teachers uh, for using AI. Well, I think it was already mentioned. No? I think is one is uh, um, professional development training, so so teach teachers on how to use AI, and the other thing is support to help them in 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 tasks that can be really made by other people. So I think training and support and and awareness of what is available there, are the the main um, actions that can be taken. No? But not only for teachers, also for students, I would say. Let me just mention one thing. I teach programming in the, to freshmen and uh, Java programming. And uh, since we have a lot of material about it, we've made the MOOC on uh, edX. We have uh, problem sets. We have slides. We did exams. So we had a lot of content. And with this content, we trained an AI and uh, gave the students a chatbot not a general chatbot, but a specific chatbot for our course 
I, I could see myself there represented because the examples and the answers were very much what I, I have been uh, um, giving personally. We give this to the students. It was the last semester, just a, a pilot study. Uh, but we saw that we thought that students would use it to really get a deep understanding of things, to really to assimilate well the concepts. No, but then we saw that we, they use it just to, okay, solve this for me, uh, and and the end they, they learned less because they they did not force their brains really to get the the concepts right, but like like as an assistant, okay, do this for me. Okay, I, I don't care. But okay, so. There, I thought, and we are thinking, how can we really um, use such a tool, which could be, I mean, it's a 24-7 tutor available for, for, to every student. Who can we use it to uh, be a powerful resource for students? No? And I think there we have, this next semester, we are going to maybe give an introduction on how to use it and how to best make use of this uh, resource. No? So I think everybody has to learn teachers and students on how to use and make a, a good use, effective and efficient use of these new technologies that are available. You are muted. Yes, yeah, <laughs> I noticed, yeah. Okay, so, uh, thank you so much. Um, uh, Jonathan, do you have anything, um, uh, any other insights to this yeah, measure? Um, talking about uh, capacity building for teachers, I think, or, or students for that matter, um, I'd like to demystify AI. People have got they put it, you know, it's like this mystery godlike thing. Let's look at AI for what it is. It's a tool. It's a tool. Yeah. And just like any other tool, we can develop competencies for it. Take PowerPoint, for example. You have a competency zero, somebody who can turn on PowerPoint, competency level zero, somebody who can Put in a text box competency level one somebody who is at competency level 10 can probably make that powerpoint work like a website yeah so so there are competency levels for every tool and i think we should look at ai as a tool and develop competency levels for people to achieve and one good place to start would be unesco's uh, competency framework for teachers and students i think it's a very clearly drawn out over the years i think they've collected enough data from across, maybe it's a bit European skewed, but yeah, it's a different question for another day. Uh, but the competency framework gives us a place to start to look at the different aspects of AI competency that need to be developed. And, and there's no two ways about it. You want people to get better at it, they have to train it, they have, they have to train using it, and they have to use it. Um, just a short, quick example, in my recent, you know, recent training in, in um, Africa, uh, uh, a director of education from Kenya attended and, and she was skeptical to the point of while traveling to the training location, she was thinking to herself, I hope I didn't waste my organization's money flying in and registering for this. But on the trip back to the hotel, she was telling us how she has learned how to use it. And in that 45 minute drive to the hotel, she was on a, on a, on a meeting call she got back to the hotel room and in 20 minutes from the meeting call that she was in, she used AI's help to, to summarize and transcribe that meeting and send a report to her team. And then in the next couple of hours in her hotel room, she actually wrote up two proposals using AI's help. So once you've learned how to use it, you use it in many ways. It's like, it's like riding a bicycle. Once you learn how to, once you're mastered riding the bicycle, you want to ride everywhere. So yeah, I think there are ways to train and, and build it, but it's a must. It's something that's a must. Thankful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. It, it's like this initial barrier, and once you once you've kind of uh, felt uh, what you can what you can do with it, people just uh, will start using it for for lots of things. Uh, and thanks as well for raising the the competency framework. That's uh, an interesting place to start. Um, Okay, then on to the, the final section of the, the panel discussion. What's the, the road forward? So um, what do we what do we need in order to change our higher education systems to be better equipped with um, AI? And I'll, I'll first start uh, asking my uh, questions to uh, Carlos since you have to leave us a bit earlier um, today. Um, 
what, what do you think how we should change our patterns of teaching, learning and assessments? Um, there's been a lot of discussions on how they should uh, change. What, what's your vision on this? Well, I, I think AI has taught us that we are teaching incorrectly. What we're doing, the, this industrial uh, way of teaching based on content, on, on like uh, very linear um, and, and, and also fragmented way of teaching is probably the wrong one. Um, we have to teach more skills. It has to be more authentic, uh, re relevant to the um, work uh, that uh, future students, the uh, graduates will, will have to work. So probably we have to rethink and uh, change from the industrial um, mode of teaching to some other smarter way. But this is very difficult. It, it, we, uh, there's a lot of inertia. That we, 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 like to do the things we know how to do, no? and and this probably requires a lot of thinking and a lot of rephrasing and a lot of maybe getting rid of all the individual courses about the very structured and linear content vomiting onto the students, etc. So I think probably it requires a very very deep rethinking of things. And this will not happen overnight. So uh, I think a lot of uh, thought has to be thought. Maybe some it would be good to do some pilot uh, courses or to some pilot studies. I think we have to rethink uh, our teaching from the ground up. Yeah, th thank you. The, but but the, the linearness and, and the authenticness are really interesting components of that. Um, as you mentioned, obviously, that will take a lot of trial uh, and there are lots of discussions. How does that exchange between the different stakeholders um, that are important for that look for you in your institution or, or how do you think that this should look? I think first, university directors said I have to be aware of this and, 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 and think like I think and, and, and uh, uh, put in, the, the tools and the resources and the uh, structures that help in rethinking this. No? And uh, in the times where the funding of these public universities is uh, going down, um, maybe the priorities are elsewhere. Uh, so I'm quite uh, pessimistic about uh, uh, a change in in the short uh, term, no? maybe in the longer term, yes, but in the short term, I think we'll go slowly. We'll continue teaching the way we're doing. Yes, yeah, higher education is a, a slow thing to change. Um, <laughs> before we, we say uh, goodbye to, to you, Carlos, uh, for today, I saw that there was one specific uh, question towards you in the Q&A box already. Um, can you share us which tool that you use to transfer, yeah, transfer just, your voice? I also to all is HeyGen, what you used, HeyGen. <laughs> Hey, that was agent. Uh, yeah, yeah. Synthesia was one of the first ones. It was very good, but uh, now Hagen, I think, is better. Although this is also uh, maybe Synthesia will over uh, improve uh, shortly. But Hagen is a quite good, very excellent uh, tool. Of course, there are also professional Hollywood style tools, which are much, much better and also much more expensive. But Hagen is a good uh, compromise. Uh, if you right. want to know, I mean, in this MOOC, an Italian MOOC, where, where I, I recorded uh, around two hours of, of videos, 25 videos, two hours, all spoken in Spanish. Uh, and it has been used all, on the one hand for this lip sync uh, and also to create an avatar. I have not shown the avatar because of a lot of time. App approximately 1,000 euros were, were used to doing this. You know? So I mean, there are some costs there, but... Uh, I mean, this MOOC will be first launched in Italian, then it will be launched in Spanish, and then we'll be launched in, in English just with one recording. So, uh, I mean. Wow, incredible. Okay, well, thank you so much uh, for answering this question, and thank you so much for your participation. Thank you uh, so much. Today, we so. leave now. I wish you all the best, and thank you very much for being able to participate in this seminar. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you so much, uh, Carlos. And going going back towards the, the the question of how we change our education system um 
how what we should change our patterns of teaching and learning. Uh, Jonathan, I'll go back to you. Um, what do you think we should change and, and how should we organize this discussion between all the stakeholders that are involved in this? Okay. Um, Ruben, to answer this question, I just want to share a story from about 30 years ago when I was in school and uh, our teachers asked us to draw they asked us to imagine the world in 2020 and draw those pictures of how it would look like. And 95% of the students who submitted their drawings had things like flying cars in 2020. It's 2024 now and I don't see any cars flying yet. <laughs> now, what I'm trying to say is, uh, even last week, I think at one discussion, uh, this question popped up. What about the classroom of the future? And, and again, if you put this into chat GPT or any of those image generating uh, tools, the idea that comes up of the classroom of the future is no more rows and rows and rows of chairs, but rather small groups of four to five people with the screen in front of them and, and very personalized learning. However, as Prof, as Prof Carlos very clearly mentioned, higher education, um, inertia is very real. To change to that overnight is impossible. It will take time. Um, one of the things that we should be working towards is personalized learning pathways. Um, maybe not so much at the tertiary level, but about for lifelong learners people who want to continue learning, not for any academic recognition, but more for career prospects, personalized learning, which is then certified and, and accredited by universities. Uh, that would be one way to go um, towards that. One of the immediate things that I think universities, um, schools for that matter, can start doing is working on assessments. We know that the old ways of asking questions are not going to work anymore. You, you give a question to a student and say, write me a report on uh, uh, the, 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 the Falklands War. And you're going to get a report generated by AI. And the most careful student will then edit that response to make sure that it's suitable and submit it. But the bulk of the work has still been done by somebody else by AI in this, in this case. So the traditional methods of assessment will definitely need to be changed. I think that's a very good starting point for, for schools and universities to start looking at how to change teaching and learning. Let's start with the assessment. Maybe make the assessments more real world. Maybe make it where, yeah, you can use chat GPT or you can use any AI to help you answer. But as your teacher, I want to see the chat that you had. So when you submit your answer to me, share the link with me as well, so that I can now go and see how you interacted with the tool. Did you just copy my question there and say, give me the answer? Or did you actually have a meaningful discourse with your AI assistant, your assistant tutor? So those kind of changes are things that we can put in place immediately, but moving to a world with flying cars and <laughs> and totally digitized three to four people classrooms may take a little bit more time. Yeah, thanks Thanks for keeping our feet on the ground on that one. Uh, I think sometimes we, we do need that in this discussion. Um, uh, Manan, I'll, I'll go to you and ask you the same question. How, how will our teaching and learning change? How should it change? And how um, should that discussion look like? How we can, can we facilitate that? I feel we need to be a little more open and prevent ourselves from being so structuralized and rigid that there is no inertia that, that, that there is an inertia actually that that we are not changed so we have to be a little more flexible to change and as carlos mentioned when he was responding to a uh, similar question where he said that ai is changing and it's changing rapidly it's developing rapidly so we need to realize that the changes we are seeing, there will be more frequent and rapid changes and maybe more uh, uh, kind of changes which we have not thought of even in the near future. So we'll have to be a little more flexible. And uh, on the assessment patterns, I think also I agree with Jonathan. 
uh, for us also in like in our universities they have made assessment patterns in a sense which has which is to an extent uh, a rebellious step against uh, ai so we need to also balance that out because then the the uh, core nature of that course of of a particular course of or for a particular kind of uh, education that that diminished because you try to mold uh, the course in a manner where you want to prevent ai entirely which honestly is very difficult so if i share an example there were courses which we had at our university in the undergraduate level which before uh, covid 19 hit or before ai had the boom were in class assessment uh, or, or take home assessments rather people used to write thorough research papers right they used to go back uh, read articles have good 10 15 days to write a thorough research paper now we are expected to memorize all the research papers not even bring uh, those papers in class and write those uh, write 2000 word answers in class so doing that in school where it was a rote learning pattern now that that getting also transformed into a uh, higher education is i think not something very suitable so i agree with jonathan that we'll have to try to figure out ways where, where we are uh, assessing the students in a manner our students in a say assessing us in a manner where uh, we have we may not use ai that that's a legitimate argument but in case we are we have a way to use it as well as keeping the nature of the course and of education intact otherwise we'll come we'll make ourselves rote learn everything as as important as memory and remembering is that i am not uh, trying to say that it's not important to memorize things at the end of the day, you have to have the knowledge, but uh, you also need to have the leverage to sit in depth with an assignment, not fear the assignment, but have the freedom to read as much as you want. Take your time, keep those papers along with you, keep the material with you and be able to write what you wish to rather than trying to memorize everything and burden yourself at the end of the day. So assessment and openness, I think, are two things which we'll have to hand in hand uh, for the future. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it seems clear that assessment is a really important part uh, of what we have to change in this regard. Uh, and finally, of course, Ursula, I'll go to you as well. What, what, what do you think on this matter? Um, I will keep it brief because I agree with the previous speakers. Uh, and I do want to underline the importance that once we even have these discussions and once we find a common ground between teachers and students and uh, institutions or national agencies uh, we need to remember that it is very fast pacing uh, ai in education and it changes constantly so we should keep up to date once we figure out the guidelines we shouldn't be like happy that it's done and leave it be for the next 20 years because within the next two years uh the AI world and the involvement of AI in education will change massively and those guidelines won't be uh, useful anymore. So I think that is also important to remember that discussion in their own way are important, crucial to create those guidelines, but we should keep having those discussions and keep uh, remembering about the importance of everything that was mentioned before, so assessment and interoperability, uh, everything, basically, just keep up to date and uh, continue uh, creating the most uh, uh, friendly university, not only to the students, but also to the teachers so that they would feel comfortable and, uh, yeah. That's a nice concept, that the, the friendly university, uh, I like that. And of course, it will be a continual process. Um, Carlos, in his answer, expresses uh, expressed the kind of um, pessimism about um, the, the the funding that goes towards higher education, but also like how that corresponds to the opportunities that we have to hold this discussion. Do you share that? What, what do you think are in the current context the best ways to hold this discussion uh, on how to change our system to make use of AI? Ursula, yeah. Okay, yeah, I was. Uh, uh, could you repeat that? 
the question because it was like yeah so it, like what do you think are the best structures that we can use to hold this discussion because uh, i asked that question to carlos and he responded with a bit of pessimism about um the the, the current situation in europe what, what's your perspective on that um i i will i will would agree a bit with the pessimism uh i think um we're very eager to have those discussions, but we don't actually have those discussions uh, in the end. So we talk about a lot about talking. Uh, and once we come to creating uh, guidelines or principles, whatever is needed, whatever each university wants to create, whatever its structure wants to have, uh, in the end, we forget about some stakeholders involved uh which in the end will end up badly for the universities and for everybody involved uh in my opinion i don't want to be too pessimistic i think we can do it and we should be a bit optimistic about it but uh we need to figure out uh the structure of the discussion itself also not only that we should have the discussion yeah so people want to have the discussions but but then actually uh, to it and we should uh, remember to involve everyone um all right thank you so much uh, these were my uh, our prepared questions uh, i saw that there's been a lot of questions coming in from the audience as well uh, please do keep them coming and keep upvoting the questions that you think are um interesting um I, some of the questions that were asked we have already tackled now in the panel discussions which is a good sign because that meant that the questions we prepared are those that actually interested the audience there's a couple more that um i'd like to ask um everyone here still so first there's a couple of questions on on uh students or researchers also using ai to write their ass assignments theses research papers that kind of stuff um are there ways that we can detect this or or how should we handle that problem um jonathan maybe i'll go first to you how should should we handle this first yeah so this is a very interesting question um that that has been asked numerous times um, why it's a difficult thing to address is simply because if you go before the days of ai if you just go back to maybe three four years ago before ai and i gave you a task i gave you an assignment to write and you had no clue how to do it. But you gave it to your brainy brother. And your brainy brother now wrote it perfectly written, perfectly cited, perfectly referenced. Gives it back to you and you hand it in. How do you penalize the student in this case? How do you? Now, AI is playing that role of that big brother now. And catching it is proving to be very difficult. Yes, there are um, AI indexes and AI uh, recognition software which claims to, to, but they're all not foolproof at this point of time. There is no 100%. So what we're thinking of, you know, advising people is, Document your writing process. If you use word processors like Microsoft, uh, there are versions, right? So every time you do something, save a version, save so that you can document your progress in writing. Yeah, that's one of the practical um, ways. The other, of course, is what I mentioned earlier. If I'm giving an assignment to my student and they're supposed to write a paper on something that I want, then I want them to use uh, generative AI as much as possible as an assistant, but I want them to share that link with me. So that then I get to see their thought process. The, the hidden benefit of doing this is the moment you give your student this instruction that you want to see the link to their chat, that puts them in alert mode that they can't really take any shortcuts. That's, that, that helps in a dual way as well. So, but it's a it's a tricky thing. There have been so many cases of, of uh, writers, even experienced researchers, submitting papers and uh, getting rejected by publishers because of alleged uh, AI writing. So one of the best ways would be to document your writing process you know, as you go along. If there's anything that comes up in the next one, two years, we'll definitely share it with everyone. 
Great. Yeah. But looking more at the process of actually writing uh, seems to be a, the most important way that we can that we can handle this right now. Um, Ursula, what's your vision on this? Uh, when it comes to figuring out if somebody uses AI, I think it is actually quite easy to do so right now. If somebody used ChatGPT specifically, uh, I can say from my experience, um, not maybe for academic papers, but for speeches uh, at conferences that I attend, it is very easy to detect if somebody used ChatGPT to create a speech because the, the word patterns and the words used uh, are very specific to that one uh, AI program. So, so far, I think it is detectable even without specific programs, at least for me. Uh, when I open a TV, I can detect which uh, advisory board to some politician use uh, AI to write speech. Uh, but I think it will be harder along the way because uh, the AI programs are learning. They have more and more data to uh, to get their information from. But I think it's also connected to if we teach students to use AI in a smart uh, and proper way, how to help them write things instead of write them for them, it's less uh, probable that they will use it to write the whole document. If we take the forbiddenness of something, it's not as tempting to use it. So if something stops being forbidden uh, as using AI in writing process, it is more helpful this way to teach them how to use it instead of forbidding them to use it because it is so helpful sometimes to, to use AI to even have a point of writing. So what you should mention in the writing. But if we don't know how to use it, just to help us write it, we'll use it to write the whole text. That's easy. So I think those are things we should focus on when it comes to detecting AI usage. OK, thank you. That's really interesting. Um, Madame, any further thoughts? I, I think I have similar thought that you, you get to give a little bit of leverage teach them how to use it and the forbiddenness going away will actually be beneficial and sharing the chat that Jonathan mentioned but uh, so because it's actually very easy to detect uh, even if you after using chat GPT you go to Twilbot to paraphrase right uh, rather than paraphrasing yourself you even ask Twilbot to paraphrase then check for grammar on Grammarly you still put that document on Turnitin and the Turnitin will give you an entire report saying it is so and so percent plagiarized. This is AI, this is Quillbot, and then this is Grammarly. Right. So, in order to uh, detect AI now, uh, there are certain platforms which help you doing it. Grammarly itself detects AI and then says it's AI detected. So, uh, so there are platforms, but I think you will have. I, I personally uh, am unsure about what might be a foolproof way in which AI and how much AI it should be allowed. But uh, I think uh, listening to the conversation we had today, Jonathan's idea sounds the best to me as of now and the best I've heard till date. So, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, another question I see popping up quite a bit is about the accessibility to uh, the AI tools and also to training. Um, one, one question that already came up during your talk, Ursula, you mentioned quite a few uh, tools. Um, do people have to pay for those? Um, do they have to pay for premium versions? What does the difference in uh, access to those tools look like? Yes, yeah, so most of, if not all the tools that I mentioned during my presentation are free of charge up to a certain point. So for instance, ChatGPT, uh, we know that has a free version of like few questions of the newer version, and then we switch to the older version, which is still free of charge. So we don't have to pay for it. Uh, the notebook uh, LM that I showed creating the podcast is free of charge. You just have to sign in and then you create your board. You, you can create different topics. Uh, Grammarly uh, on the basic uh, 
it is free of charge the basic level but uh, for instance i have the pro or i don't know how it's called level but it's also provided by my university so i don't have to pay for it because the university has a signed in agreement with the grammarly for the students to use free of charge so i think this is also very important for students that um uh, I know it's not fun to hear by universities that they have to pay for additional things for students because the money is tied wherever we go in the world when it comes to education systems. But uh, it, at least this ensures accessibility for students from different financial backgrounds. So whether somebody's struggle with money or can afford it, they have the equal ground that they can start from and use uh, the same. Uh, programs equally so there there are additional programs that i didn't mention that are paid for that you, you need to have a subscription or pay for it once every two years whatever but uh, there are a lot of accessible ai programs right now that students can use free of charge and once again i'm mentioning students specifically but they're open for everybody so teachers can use it as well okay uh, thank you. Madam, what, what does this look like for you? Yes, I think it will be the same case for me as well. It will not take a very long, uh, both for us as well. Uh, there are certain AIs which are free of cost, few which have been provided by the university, which were not earlier considered as stringent AIs, uh, but now are. And for premium versions, then you have to pay. For example, I personally use WIC, which is an app uh, application to build websites etc so with I, I use the version which is now premium but uh, and it helps you also obtain your own domain and gives you additional features but you can also without purchasing a domain and using limited features you can build your own website on with so uh, I, I completely agree it's the same way I think for us as well yeah. Mm -hmm. I think accessibility is something that's really uh, close to the hearts of some of us um, because without accessibility then AI becomes just another digital divide that magnifies the digital divide. Yeah? It's a tool that is so powerful that if it's accessible it can level playing fields. If it's not accessible it, it's going to dangerously uh, widen the divide. Having said that, there are tools just as what uh, Ursula and Manan said, there are tools that are free with certain limitations. Um, there are tools that are paid for and if you happen to be in a certain tier university, then maybe the university pays for certain things. Um, but that should not deter somebody who is interested to actually go and source out these free tools. I know sometimes teachers say that, you know, I, I don't have time to go and search for all these tools, well, which is very true. They, they may not have the time, but a simple way again, just go, go get on uh, places like LinkedIn or a lot of teachers still use Facebook. So Facebook is a good place to go to. I know a lot of students don't use Facebook anymore, uh, but Facebook is a good place to go. Uh, and, and and join up on those interest groups like AI for teachers or you know, something like that. And there you will find people constantly sharing, doing the searching of all the tools and sharing the free ones, sharing the new ones, etc. So you don't have to go around searching. Just join a group on any of these social or professional me uh, media platforms and, and make use of other people's effort searching and sharing this information and you have access to those free tools. Um, some free tools have got a limit of what you can do. Some free tools uh, allow you to do as much as you want, but at a lower level than the paid one. So it's a matter of finding uh, what's available. But beyond that, I think it is the responsibility of whoever can, organizations or institutions, to ensure that we are doing as much as we can to provide greater accessibility. Uh, I mean, OpenAI has got a particular plan for students, uh, for, for academia. 
You know, so it, it should be up to the university to maybe write to them and say, hey, I've got so many students and so many of them happen to be in the uh, below 40, B40 category of students. And could you support them by maybe making this uh, half price and then we top up some kind of mechanism co cooperation between the universities and maybe the private sector to make these basic minimum tools available to all. Because accessibility is, in my personal opinion, accessibility is more important than dealing with all this cheating and, and stuff. Cheating will eventually balance itself out. <laughs> but, but if you don't have access, then it's dangerous. All right, thank you so much. I think that's a great note to end this, uh, this panel discussion on. Um, thank you so much, Jonathan, Manan, and Ursula for your insights and also your presentations. Um, and to Carlos uh, as well, of course. Uh, with that, I, I round off this, this panel discussion and these uh, presentations. Um, thank you to all the speakers uh, and also to the to the audience uh, from my side. It was a really nice opportunity to be able to um, uh, learn from all the insights that were presented here today. And with that, I hand over back to Nils, who will uh, round off this online seminar. Well, thank you very much, Ruben, for the professional moderation and of course to our speakers and the audience for your active participation. Uh, now to wrap up the meeting, I'd like to bring up two more poll questions for the participants. For this, please again share with us your views by clicking on the answer option that fits best to your situation. The first question is, uh, after this online seminar, do you think that you will now use AI tools more often in your daily work or study? The options now are, no, I don't think so. Uh, maybe. Uh, yes, from time to time, or yes, on a regular basis. And I see answers coming in already. And it's good to see that there's hardly anyone saying, no, I don't think so. Okay, this is good to see. A couple of more seconds for everyone to answer. Okay, thank you very much for answering this. Uh, and in fact, it remained, as, uh, as I already mentioned, there's no one saying, no, I don't think so. But the majority of people think that this, uh, they will use it from time to time, 47% uh, um, uh, of the people, and uh, uh, even more will say that they use it on a regular basis. Uh, to compare this with the question we had at the start, when we asked, do you already use the tools in your daily work and study, the picture looked fairly similar with 70% uh, of the people saying that they don't use it at all and uh, around 80% saying that they use it from time to time or on a regular basis. So quite comparable. And uh, yeah, we wish you good uh, luck and fun uh, trying out some of the tools we used uh, today. Uh, now we come to the final question for today, which is uh, please let us know uh, that having seen today's examples, do you feel that your institution is well prepared for the use of AI in higher education settings? And here, the question option, uh, the answer options are, yes, I feel my institution is quite advanced and does a lot to stay up to date. Uh, well, there's uh, some efforts, but I feel that we need to do more. Or no, I feel my institution is lagging behind. Okay, some answers coming in still. Okay. And here the majority of the people say, around half the people say, well, there are some efforts, but I feel that we need to do more. And um, another 32% uh, of the people feel, no, I feel my institution is lagging behind and more needs to be done. And only 22% uh, of the people say, yes, I feel my institution is quite advanced and does a lot to stay up to date. So I think that's a clear uh, um, task for us as institutions and um, to, to do something about it and to yeah, really uh, put effort into this. Thank you very much for everyone for participating. Uh, now, uh, a final brief announcement. We've seen today different tools and there were quite a few questions on these uh, that due to time limits, we could answer only in parts, but we are currently working on a small uh, collection of helpful AI tools to make the landscape a bit more accessible. For this, we will reach out to all of you in due course uh, with the corresponding survey link. If you could indicate in this survey all the AI tools which you are using and find useful in your daily life, uh, this would be of great added value. We will then collect these responses, process these, and share the results with you afterwards. 
So when we reach out to you in the next weeks, please do take three minutes to share with us your experiences. And now one last request. When you leave the meeting, a feedback form will pop up. We would be grateful if you could uh, take a moment to fill it out so we have some feedback from you and can uh, improve for future events. The video recording of the seminar, as well as the speaker's presentations that was asked for also in the Q&A section I saw, will be made available soon on the ASEM Education Secretariat's website. Uh, the link you can see here in the chat again. And yeah, once again, thank you very much to everyone for participating. And with this, I close the meeting and wish all of you a nice day or a nice evening. Thank you very much.